Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Winkler moves that the rule therein be suspended and an urgency be declared and that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that House File Number 4531 be given its second and third readings and be placed upon its final passage. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, members, I ask for your support in this motion. This is to suspend our rules pursuant to the Constitution to allow us to take action in an urgent situation. We did. And uh, members, I can't think of uh, a more emergent situation than the one we have before us today. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the motion to suspend the rules to take up the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its second reading. Second reading, House File number 4531. Second reading. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File number 4531. Third reading. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, members, uh, this is the uh, bill that we have put together in the last 10 days with the input of the administration, with the review and consent of the minority in the Senate, the majority in the Senate, and the minority in the House. We have done this work together in adverse conditions, and we have not, unfortunately, been able to provide the kind of public engagement and public input that is characteristic of this body. However, I hope that members of the public and members of the House will understand that our duty to protect the public, our duty to protect the legislatures, the legislators and staff in this institution, and our duty to continue to function constitutionally and legally have to be balanced. Uh, we have complied with the law, we've complied with the Constitution, we have protected members and staff, and I believe that this bill takes substantial steps forward to protect the health and safety of the public. Members, the bill is available online. And it was unfortunate uh, that it came together over the course of 10 days and is available now, but has had limited opportunity for review. The bill is the product of the work of a lot of legislators. And so to the extent that you have questions about specific articles or specific items, I am the author, but, and I have an under, understanding of every part of the bill, but if there are technical or detailed questions, we will do our best to identify those who are here who are most, uh, have the most in-depth knowledge of how this bill uh, comes together and how it functions. In simple terms, members, we have Article 1, which is appropriations and some policy related to a number of issues, and Article 2, which are, is exclusively policy. The bill provides for a $200 million emergency fund available to the administration with oversight from the legislature through a process uh, created uh, of a council with representation from all four legislative caucuses. Uh, the $200 million fund is used to protect the public health and safety in the COVID pandemic situation only. We provide funding for homeless uh, shelters. We provide funding for child care and child care providers, funding for veterans, food shelves. We provide emergency agriculture disaster relief, we provide assistance and some space for members of the public who need to comply with real ID. We provide an extension for driver's licenses. We provide a corrections uh, medical release provision. Uh, we provide extensions on professional and business licensing, uh, extensions on state grants, loans, work study requirements. We codify a number of unemployment insurance extensions that the administration brought forward through executive order and provide grants to tribal governments. We have a number of items that are not included in this bill that will remain the work of this session and the governor in order to bring forward their necessary relief, including workers' compensation, school district hourly employees, rental assistance, uh, a request from the ju judiciary to toll statutes of limitations and court deadlines, and a long line of other legislative action that we will be required to take in the weeks and months ahead in order to make not only Minnesota uh, as prepared and able to withstand this pandemic wave that we are experiencing right now, but to recover afterwards and provide a more secure, healthier state for our people. And uh, so members, we have a long, long uh, body of work ahead of us. We are trying to do so under difficult and unusual circumstances, but this bill today represents a substantial step forward in serving the public need in this time of emergency. I would ask for your support. 
The member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I came in as a uh, just a point of order that the bill is not online. I've had messages from people that they're not able to read it. Only after you said it was online did the link appear, but it is still not available for public. Um, there's also no pages out in the in the lobby to bring us copies of the bills. I would ask that I know this was crammed at the last minute for us to review, but you're asking for people to vote and debate on a bill that wasn't even available until just now. Uh, when I just got a copy of the bill handed to me by uh, Sergeant Adarm. So um, please keep this into consideration. It's not uh, available for public consumption, and uh, people have not been able to impact, you know, read and understand the impacts to this bill. Uh, businesses in the district are very concerned about the legislation, but it wasn't available until just now, and it's still not available online. Representative Munson, we will pause until we make sure that every uh, member of the body uh, can read the bill. It's 33 pages, and until we can make sure that it is online and available to every member of the public. The member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, thank you, and thank you, Representative Winkler, for the uh, introduction of the bill. Um, members, I think it's important to remember that the last thing any person in this chamber wants to do is to stand or be a barrier or obstacle to getting assistance to people during a time of crisis. The second to last thing any member in this chamber wants to do uh, is vote for legislation that they don't understand or that has unintended consequences. And so for those of us today who are voting on this, it's, impor it's important that we balance those two very important perspectives. Um, this bill, the overall uh, spending amounts in this bill are as follows. Uh, total general fund spending is $298 million dollars with $32 million of special, uh, special revenue spending, funding from special revenues. Uh, of particular interest to me that I think is important is the assistance for veterans that are contained in this bill, as well as the small business grants, the loans for small businesses to help them during what is truly a historic time. Um, but members, I do want to highlight a provision in this bill um, that, again, in balancing, and I'll, I'll be voting for the bill today, and I would encourage members to, to do the same, and that is on uh, page 7, line 12. This is the COVID-19 Minnesota Fund. And in lines 7.12 through 7.20 is uh, how this $200 million can be spent. Now, because this is a crisis, it is appropriate to have broad language that gives discretion to the executive branch. Uh, it is also important to have legislative review of these items as they're going out. But I would just highlight to members that this language is very broad in terms of the flexibility we have given the executive branch. It is my hope uh, it is my, that we are trusting the executive branch to appropriate these funds as, the, as they see fit to respond to this crisis and that it is appropriate. Uh, Madam Speaker, members, as we're going forward, we're going to have many conversations on many issues uh, dealing with the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we will be addressing in the future is how to pay for this stuff. Uh, we are in extraordinarily difficult fiscal times, and it is important that we begin to have this conversation not only amongst ourselves, but also with members of the public. Unlike the federal government, the state of Minnesota has to balance its budget. Uh, we cannot borrow money like the federal government. Uh, we have to pay for everything, have a balanced budget, and do this at a time when we are seeing an extraordinary collapse in tax revenues to the state at the exact same time that expenditures are rapidly rising as more and more Minnesotans become qu uh, qualify for our general as our assistance programs in this state. One data point for people to understand. In the last 10 days, the number of unemployed Minnesotans has tripled. It has tripled over the course of 10 days. And those, and those numbers may even be underestimated because they don't, uh, it's only reflecting those who are applying for unemployment uh, insurance compensation. So as we go forward, we're going to be making exceptionally difficult choices. Uh, choices the public will not like, the choices that we will not like. But as has been demonstrated with this crisis, proactive, strong, preventative leadership on the front side can yield to enormous benefits in avoiding a collapse on the backside. So as we go forward in this journey, uh, it will be challenging, uh, particularly from a dollars and cents perspective. 
I do want to thank the speaker. I want to thank Majority Leader Winkler, Representative Dowd, and others who have participated in this process. Uh, it's, it's good to see Minnesota come together. And last and finally, I want to thank Governor Walls uh, for stepping up at a time of, uh, of true crisis. Uh, sometimes we can uh, we see the benefits of leadership. Sometimes we see the lack of leadership. And it's good to see that our governor is in charge and assisting in this process and moving us forward. So, Madam Speaker, members, I'll be voting yes on this today, and I would encourage members of this chamber to do the same. Thank you. Members and members of the public who are looking for a copy of the bill, it is at house.mn on the COVID-19 page. It was posted at 1154. There's a PDF and plain text version. The member from Wabasha, Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate, Madam Speaker, the efforts to get this information about this bill out to the public. As a matter of fact, uh, I understand that there was an earlier version of this bill, which was the first one that I saw, at, and that was emailed to me at 6.09 a.m. this morning. That was a 24-page bill. This one in front of us is 33 pages, and Madam Speaker, I received it about 30 minutes ago. So. Um, Really, Madam Speaker, if we were going to do our due diligence as a body for the people of Minnesota in understanding this bill, reading it, and doing our legislative responsibilities about a bill, by the way, Madam Speaker and members, that did not go through a committee process, this just showed up a half hour ago. There hasn't been committee meetings open to the public to scrutinize uh, the contents of this bill as they came forward. I haven't seen any committee reports come before this body uh, relating to this bill and its, um, its construction. And uh, Madam Speaker, I know we're under uh, a situation that's very dire for Minnesotans and certainly uh, the uh, response so far uh, can be equally as dire for Minnesota's uh, families and businesses, uh, but we need to understand what is in this bill, what it does. Um, really, Madam Speaker and Mr. Majority Leader, we would be well served to uh, recess for a portion of the day for the body to understand this and get a better chance uh, before we go forward and approve this bill before us today. Uh, but I will uh, bring forward a, a couple of questions, Madam Speaker, that I have, and then certainly some comments as we get uh, down the road, but I would ask the body to entertain the idea of, um, of recessing so that we can better digest the bill and be much more responsible and deliberate uh, about our efforts here. Uh, on behalf of what I just learned is a 200 or 300 and uh, 20 or 330 million dollar bill. Um, and I didn't even know the amount of that until about three minutes ago. Uh, and the first question I have, uh, Madam Speaker, would be for Representative Liebling, if she would yield. She will yield. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Liebling. Uh, Representative Liebling, not included in this bill, I understand that uh, President Trump has extended to the states the ability to have reciprocity for licensed medical professionals in an emergency like we have in front of us. Um, and that means that if uh, communities like Winona, Wabasha, Stillwater, or Duluth along the border needed additional doctors or nurses, they could come over and be hired uh, from Wisconsin without the uh, obstruction of the uh, license questions about those people uh, being an impediment to them being hired and used in this emergency situation. So I understand the president has extended to states the ability to have reciprocity for that, um, notwithstanding all the licensing stuff that we have that is standing in the way uh, to uh, allow our hospitals to access those very important resources. Um, so my question is, why isn't language in the bill approving uh, that uh, executive order here from Minnesota. I understand Minnesota's got to approve it uh, before our, our uh, doctors, our, our hospitals in Winona and Wabasha and Stillwater and Duluth could potentially uh, hire people from Wisconsin or conversely, people from Wisconsin 
uh, could hire people from Minnesota? So that's the question, uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members and Representative Drazkowski. Well, my first answer is that this bill certainly doesn't do everything that's needed by a long shot. Um, and this is not going to be the end of our work by a long shot. And we're here to do some urgent, urgent things. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things that members of this body think are really urgent that aren't in this bill because they were blocked by others who didn't agree on the urgency. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is my understanding is we don't need the president to tell us that we can waive rules about who gets licensed in our state. That's a state issue. So whatever the president's doing on that is, I, I think is irrelevant because we can do that. And one of the reasons that we haven't viewed that until this point as really urgent is because every state is having the same problem. Minnesota is not going to import a bunch of health care providers from other places. They're busy in those other places. So that's why, you know, it may be that at some point some flexibility is needed. I don't know. That should certainly be thought about. At this point, though, Minnesota is not the place that is having the worst problems. So um, other states certainly could be waiving those rules in their states and trying to get some of our providers to go there. But I haven't really heard a call, a specific call, that we need to be importing and that there are people to import from other states. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Liebling, um, if there's one thing that should be in the bill here before us, that's it. We need to remove the obstacles of government that are in the way for our local people and our communities to do their job to best serve people who need health care. That's what this is about. And it is glaringly missing from this bill today, members. But we have all kinds of other provisions in here, um, many of them that support portions of government and, and uh, give uh, uh, preference to large daycares, as an example, uh, over home-run daycares, once again, in the bill. I don't know why we are doing that in this bill. But in the meantime, when we have the opportunity, and President Trump extended this representative labeling to all 50 states, so I'm not on the HHS committee. I don't know the answer to whether we could suspend that ourselves. If we can, it should be in this bill. Or we should ratify what, or what uh, President Trump uh, asked us to do or gave us the ability to do. Uh, but it's not in this bill. It's one thing that's glaringly missing. It's one of the reasons I'm not going to vote for the bill today. Uh, but uh, thank you for your response. Um, I think either we need to pass as a legislature or the governor needs to sign that extension by the president to give us the ability to do that right now, today, because it's nonsense for us to not do it. Um, Madam Speaker, could I, I don't know, Madam Speaker, who I'm looking for here, but uh, the question is around... Uh, the, the question is around, uh, i got to get the right page here, Sec, uh, Article 1, Section 10 of the bill. Could you state what the topic is? The topic is Tribal Nations Grants. Representative Winkler would be your correct person to ask to yield. Representative Juskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Winkler, um, this item was not in the bill uh, in the draft that I received at 6.09 a.m. this morning, but it was in the one that uh, got dropped on my desk, actually came to my email, and I printed off about now 35 minutes ago uh, here. Um, what it does is it extends $11 million uh, to 11 different uh, tribal nations. Um, and I'm trying to understand the details about how it works. Uh, but one of the things I see in there that really has me perplexed about the thought behind this item is that these tribal nations can apply to the Commissioner of Revenue for these $11 million until April 8th of 2020. And then uh, the tribal nations are expected to report by April 14th of 2020, six days later after the latest uh, opportunity for them to apply for these monies. Um, Representative Winkler, 
that doesn't seem to be adequate time for anybody to report on anything. So again, the thought that went behind this bill is very much in question. Um, we didn't have a committee process. That's uh, why we're going to have a lot of problems with this bill going forward. We're going to look back on this retrospectively and say, how did those things happen? Members, we don't even know what those things are right now, but that's what we're going to be saying. So my question, Madam Speaker and Representative Winkler, is this. Um, are there any items either in this bill, in the $250 million or more that was passed uh, the last time we met here for hospitals and other uh, uh, medical providers, uh, or in this bill, or in any of the federal money in the $2.2 trillion uh, that passed the Senate this morning and will likely be passed by the U.S. House uh, and available uh, for aid uh, throughout all 50 states, and certainly, Madam Speaker and uh, Representative Winkler, the state of Minnesota here over the next several weeks and months. So the question is, are these nations, are, are they, uh, are their members um, ineligible for any of these items without this provision in the bill? He will yield. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, Rep Representative Duroskowski, this section is intended to address a particular problem that tribal nations have, which is that their primary source of revenue, the casinos, have been shut down. And because uh, tribal nations function differently than the rest of the state in the sense that their uh, business operations help to fund uh, health care, help to fund housing, help to fund uh, food, and so forth, uh, they are uh, concerned that they are going to be running short on funds to deliver health care to their uh, tribal members in short order. Uh, it, certainly this uh, $11 million fund is not a complete answer to that issue, uh, but it does permit those tribes with the greatest need to apply for funds through this program, get the money quickly, report back quickly on how they will be using it, and then any unspent funds from this $11 million appropriation will be distributed amongst those who applied for the grants. Uh, certainly they will have needs in excess of a $1 million apiece, and this will not solve all of the problem, but it will be a help as they start to spend down their reserves in taking care of their tribal members. So they function differently. I believe also the federal legislation will include aid to uh, tribes as well. Uh, but we will uh, certainly have time the next time we convene on April 14th to hear how this money will be spent or has been spent by the tribal nations, and we can act further if necessary at that time. Representative Driskowski. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. So if, if the Majority Leader would yield again, please. He will yield. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you. Uh, so, Representative Winkler, I mean, um, are these tribal nations eligible for the unemployment insurance? Are they eligible for the business loans that are going to be coming from the federal government? And I understand are in this bill somewhere, which I have not read yet because I don't believe they were in the original version of the bill I read, um, or any of the other... Um, extensions of financial or other types of support in this bill, the one that was passed several days ago here, or the federal one. Are there any of those that these tribal nations and their members are not eligible for? Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, Representative Druskowski, certainly they would be eligible for unemployment benefits and other uh, benefits that they have paid into, and the application of the relief that we're providing would help them if they qualify for it. The issue you have to really keep in mind, though, is that tribes function independently. And so their health care systems, their education systems, their housing, food support, all of those things function separately through their own tribal government, provided uh, funds provided through their own separate general funds. So just because we enact a program for unemployment doesn't necessarily mean that tribal health care is going to be able to support uh, the needs of the community during a pandemic. So this is to get some money out quickly to address their unique circumstances, gives us time to see how that money was used or we'll, uh, in, how they intend to use it, and we can address it further the next time we convene on April 14th. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Majority Leader Winkler. Um, these are discussions, members, that should have happened in committee, that did not, and certainly um, if we can uh, not pass this bill today, uh, we're going to have the ability after we adjourn to meet remotely. We could meet tomorrow, we could meet the next day, and the day after, if that's the need and desire. Um, but 
it definitely requires more thought, more uh, discussion uh, that it certainly hasn't had. Uh, members, we are approaching a storm. Uh, it's going to be looked at and characterized or could be as a disaster. And uh, I think of uh, my communities and the disaster assistance uh, 10 or 15 years ago that happened there. And uh, some of these items in the bill and the language is in Chapter 12. And what happens during a disaster is you go through it, you wait for the winds to die down so you can actually see what you have. Right now, um, there are numbers floating around. The governor is saying that half of the state is going to get this, which, members, I don't think that is responsible. Um, I think that's actually reckless discussion. Um, but there are numbers being thrown around, speculation on both sides of the severity of this thing. We don't know. But what we do know going on is there's a lot of uncertainty. The winds are blowing in front of us and the people of our state right now. And when those winds die down, we will have clarity. We will have granularity of what the problem is and what the problem isn't. Right now, we're putting together a bill for what we think the problem might be in the future. What we need to do, members, if anything in this bill, and I don't see it in the bill, is take a portion of the four plus billion dollars of the people's money that's sitting here right now and send it to the people of Minnesota for them to use in their families, in their businesses, in their endeavors to make it through this storm because they in their household know with clarity what their problem is right now, tomorrow, and the next day. And members, that is the type of action, if any, we should be taking at this time. Government's reaction, not so much. We should wait until for government's reaction till we know what the response needs to be and then take the, the, the appropriate response. For those reasons, Madam Speaker, members, I'll be voting against the bill. Urge you to join me in doing the same. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And um, since we were convening today, um, I wanted to take this opportunity to address just some general things, and primarily to the governor, because it's really hard to get through to his office right now. And um, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of the healthcare workers and the healthcare community that have been pulling together through this crisis. And in fact, the entire state has been pulling together, and it's really something to see. And everyone is making enormous sacrifices to flatten the curve, to protect our health care workers, and to keep this virus from spreading. Small rural hospitals who rely heavily on elective surgery revenues are struggling mightily. Health care workers are distressed over the lack of personal protective equipment. Yesterday, the governor issued a stay-at-home policy to further help flatten this curve and provide much needed time for our health care providers and facilities to prepare. However, there is one, a million dollar corporation that to date has not had to participate in the pain that everyone else is experiencing. Nationally, this corporation had $1.3 billion in revenue with approximately $530 million coming from taxpayer dollars. This corporation uses personal protective equipment. The majority of the procedures they perform are elective, yet the governor has counted them as essential. 
If you look at page five of the governor's executive order yesterday, they're listed near the top. Number two on the list of health care and public health essential workers. That corporation is Planned Parenthood. Governor Walls, you are making difficult decisions every day, and I thank you and your team for what you are doing. But I ask you not to be tone deaf at this critical time. I have talked to nurses that are frightened over the lack of personal protection equipment. Governor Walls, would you rather protect a nurse that is caring for a, for a critically ill COVID patient or someone performing an abortion? Nurses in various places are protecting themselves with plastic garbage bags. All the while, it's business as usual at Planned Parenthood. It's a simple choice, really. Today, we're providing an additional almost $300 plus million dollars to fight this fight. Extraordinary sacrifices have been made by everyone in this state. Small rural hospitals and larger ones, too, are losing revenue every day as they forego elective surgeries to save valuable protective equipment. What makes Planned Parenthood so special? Governor Walls, please remove Planned Parenthood as an essential business. Require them to get in this fight with the rest of Minnesota. Have them turn over the coveted PPE that they have to fellow Minnesotans that are on the front lines of this fight with COVID. Minnesota is watching. Please save the nurse in the ICU with a sick COVID patient by getting her the scarce masks and PPE from any place you can find them, including Planned Parenthood. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any further discussion? The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. Um, I'm certainly, uh, this has been a weird week uh, for all of us. Um, I know I've done a lot of work from home. I think yesterday I was on conference calls for probably 10 hours, maybe more than that. I used my little uh, AirPods in my ears. The battery went dead twice yesterday on them while I was talking on the phone. Uh, but we were doing really good work, and, and I'm proud of the work that we did uh, together to respond to this emergency. Unlike the partisan bickering in Washington, here in Minnesota, we are working together because that's what Minnesotans do. Minnesota has a history of stepping up in times of crisis. I remember the Red River Valley flooding, uh, the tornadoes that have devastated many parts of the state many different times, the avian influenza a couple of years ago that hit our turkey farmers so hard, and so many more. We overcome those challenges, and we will overcome the COVID-19 crisis. I certainly recognize the fear and anxiety and uncertainty that Minnesotans are feeling. There are concerns about the governor's executive orders and what does that mean for the future of their jobs, their businesses, and much more. They should know that we are all united in our work to prepare and respond to this pandemic. Some of the best bipartisan work that we've seen in this chamber in years has been going on this past week. Minnesotans are going to get through this thanks to the hard work of the heroes who are stepping up in times of crisis. We've got medical, medical professionals working in very difficult circumstances to save lives. We've got truck drivers keeping supply lines moving. We've got grocery stores stocking their shelves and, and working very hard to keep ahead of the throngs of customers that are flooding into their stores to buy things. We've got postal workers, our law enforcement personnel, our first responders, our teachers and parents who are stepping up to teach their kids at home our daycare providers who are providing much needed daycare to our uh, families that are affected by the health uh, healthcare workers and first responders and, and law enforcement officers. We will get through this crisis, not because of the bills that we pass, but because of the hard work by all Minnesotans. I want to say we've had a, an, an immense amount of public input over the last week, and while our work looked very different uh, this time than it normally does, we are uh, obviously operating much differently uh, than we normally would. I appreciate the efforts to make that as absolutely transparent as possible. Uh, while we know it wasn't as transparent as normal, it certainly was. 
was uh, made every effort was made to, to make sure that that was transparent. I know that I had thousands of emails from Minnesotans. The speaker shared with me earlier that she had over 10,000 emails from Minnesotans concerned about different provisions and, and different things that we were talking about. Uh, we tried to advance and, and take that input into consideration in all of the decisions that were made and in all of the language in this bill. One of my biggest concerns uh, in this bill, obviously there's some expenditure of funds, uh, $290 million, something like that. Right now this bill is written that those are general fund dollars. I was probably a broken record over the last week. And sometimes, uh, I'd like to say sometimes in the room I was the only one saying, but actually it was sometimes on the conference call, I was the only one saying over and over, where is this money coming from? Members, we know that on the books we have a $1.5 billion surplus, but in actuality, that surplus is a projected surplus. We all in here understand that. That money hasn't been collected yet. That's projected to come in over our expenditures over the course of the rest of this biennium. I think we all understand the situation that we're in. We've heard that there's three times as many unemployed people right now than there was before this started. The revenue to the state of Minnesota will take a drastic reduction because of this. And the economic crisis going on in our country and in our state and for families may be greater than the COVID-19 crisis itself. So it's an important question to ask, where is this money coming from? One of the provisions that we did seek uh, that was put into the funding on the COVID-19 Minnesota fund was that that fund was, was uh, appropriated for 45 days. And that will force us as a legislature to come back and revisit that provision and ask ourselves in the meantime, where is this money coming from? Now we got some good news yesterday when the Senate passed the federal bill that Minnesota will get at a minimum $1.25 billion to help us in our response to the COVID-19 crisis. I think we're taking every extra precaution to make sure that the expenditures in this bill will be able to be covered by those dollars coming from the federal government. My main goal in this process has been to preserve as much of our spending as we can because every decision that we make today to push off and kick, kick the can down the road will make our work much tougher next year when we have a deficit that may be greater than many of us saw in 2011. This is a real financial crisis for the revenues coming into the state of Minnesota. And while we need to be alert of that and be ca uh, cautious in our uh, approach and cognizant in, in understanding the depth of that problem, the financial crisis that Minnesota families may face is much greater. So we find ourselves having to respond to those Minnesota families, sometimes not exactly knowing how we're going to respond to the, to the revenue uh, reduction that's coming in the state of Minnesota. But members, please be aware that we, money does not grow on trees around here, and we need to be very cautious and watch every dollar that we spend. And while I'm proud of the work that we did and we stepped up to provide needed dollars at a, at a time of emergency for our state, and I've, I've signed on as a co-author to this bill because I believe so strongly in the work that we did, but we need to pay attention over the next uh, 45, 50, 55 days until we adjourn sine die to our budget as well. And we may not receive another budget revenue forecast until December 1st. And frankly, that's too late for us to, to take action, uh, to start reducing uh, discretionary spending in the state of Minnesota. So my push to you is going to be that we make a, a, a very conscious effort to look at and reduce discretionary spending in the state now and that we answer the question always, where is the money coming from that we're spending? So that we don't make the problem next year that we all will have to face, so that we don't make that greater. So Madam Speaker, uh, I appreciate uh, very sincerely all the efforts that were put in by the majority party, by the minority party, um, all of the staff and the work that they put into this bill has been phenomenal. Um, I know that we set deadlines that we tried very hard to meet and we didn't always meet them. This language was supposed to be posted last night. Uh, we were on the phone with the governor both last night and this morning working out final details. Uh, but Minnesotans can rest assured that because of this bill, 
uh, we're going to put much needed help out across the state and give resources to people who are fighting this, uh, this, uh, this emergency on the front lines. We're going to give them tools that they need, and I'm very proud of that work. So thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd appreciate if members would support the bill. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, members, I appreciate your cooperation today in uh, debating and voting under unusual circumstances, and I appreciate, of course, the uh, tireless work of the Chief Clerk and his staff, the Sergeant at Arms, and all those who have uh, put their own uh, health and families' health at some risk in order to allow us to function in a democratic manner. We have grave and difficult days ahead. We do not know, and probably not knowing, is the most difficult part, uh, what the course of this pandemic will take. We don't know what effect it will have on family finances, jobs, or our economy. We certainly don't know what effect it will have on state finances. We can have some hope and some encouragement that in Washington they managed to put together an economic package that will help us. But the immediate problems of personal protective equipment, ventilators, respirators, hospital beds, ICU availability, those issues are going to be front and center, and they are being handled uh, by the administration. Our role as a legislative branch is to provide the necessary resources because we have the power of the purse, to provide the authority to act, and to provide the accountability and oversight after the fact to ensure that everything that could be done was done as well as it possibly could in the crisis. And then it will be our job to help Minnesota recover, revive, and move on. So members, we have much work to be done. This is just the beginning, but it is an important first step, and I would ask for a green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Anderson. Anderson votes aye. Bennett. Bennett votes aye. Bernardi. Bernardi votes aye. Bo. Bo votes aye. Cantrell. Cantrell votes aye. Carlson A. Carlson A votes aye. Christensen. Christensen votes aye. Detmer. Aye. Detmer votes aye. Elkins. Aye. Elkins votes aye. Freiburg. Yes. Freiburg votes aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen votes aye. Hansen. 
Hansen votes aye. Hassan. Aye. Hassan votes aye. Heinzemann. Heinzemann votes aye. Jordan. Aye. Jordan votes aye. Cleavorn. Cleavorn votes aye. Lewick. Aye. Lewick votes aye. Nornis. Aye. Nornis votes aye. Novotny. Novotny votes aye. Olson. Aye. Olson votes aye. Purcell. Pearson. Aye. Pearson votes aye. Pinto. Aye. Pinto votes aye. Schumacher. Schumacher votes aye. Schultz. Aye. Schultz votes aye. Scott. Aye. Scott votes aye. Stevenson. Aye. Stevenson votes aye. Swazinski. Aye. Swazinski votes aye. Tabke. Aye. Tabke votes aye. Joachim. Joachim votes aye. Hertos. Hertos votes aye. Okay. Sandell. Sandell votes aye. Any other members wishing to have their vote recorded? The clerk will close the roll. There being 99 ayes and four nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.